Hey, everyone. Um, just as we take our building journey, it's a joy uh, today to uh, have a chat with my good friend, David McGregor. David McGregor is the National Director of the Vineyard, but he's also my boss from back in the day in Christchurch. Uh, and they were just so kind to us as we uh, moved up here to plant and just supported us enormously. And the reason I wanted to have a chat with him today is because um, the journey that Grace Vineyard and Christchurch have taken and the journey that Dave and his team have taken over the years in terms of um, growing and just an incredible, just growing an incredible culture of generosity, but also uh, a faith and um, and a confidence that God wants us as ordinary Kiwi churches to be uh, have, have big dreams for the kingdom of God. I and mean, it's just amazing what's happened down there. So uh, it's a joy to, uh, to have a chat with Dave. And um, Dave, thank you so much for taking the time. I know you've got a lot on your plate. Can you just tell us a little bit about the start of Grace Vineyard because it's pretty cool that I mean you look at the church now and it's like got how many campuses have you got now like five or six campuses or six campuses yep. six campuses six, six, and you've got amazing campus, yeah. facilities all around the place I mean it's incredible but you started in a school hall just like we are at the moment yep. and uh, so do you want to tell us about those early early years did I presume I mean the church is so generous so I'm just presuming that you talked about giving a whole lot in those early days and that it all just sort of started from there but how, tell us about how things started for you guys uh, as you guys planted the church and 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 how things kind of started yeah in terms of the buildings and stuff well we started not really intending to plant a church actually we uh, just through a whole set of circumstances uh, found ourselves out of the church we were in and a small group of us went uh, hired a local school we didn't have any great ambition other than the fact we wanted to preach the gospel and we wanted uh, lost people to get saved and we were in a school, but um, for some reason, God blessed it, and lots of people started turning up, and we couldn't fit into our school anymore. So we started um, thinking we need buildings. And actually, to be honest with you, I didn't have a huge amount of faith for buildings and finances and things. And actually, probably typical for our movement, um, I didn't. I never wanted to talk about giving. I didn't want to be one of those churches that talked about money all the time. So I never talked about it. And the reason that I never talked about it was I wanted to be liked. And I thought if I ever talk, about, and people make it very clear that if you ever talk about money, we won't like you. So I thought, well, that's easy. I'll just never talk about money. And um, the only problem was I always thought that if you, um, you know, are a good pastor and you're kind and you preach the word and you preach discipleship and you do everything right people will just give and i discover that that actually is a myth it doesn't work so we would have had in the high 90 percent of people that didn't give a cent to us and so for a number of years i had to even when our church grew very large uh we didn't have staff and i had to work pretty much full time and um yeah we just didn't have money coming in but pe people um were very kind with their volunteering and stuff but People started saying, oh, we've got so large, we need a building. So they started looking for buildings. And I thought, well, the only problem is we don't have any money. And uh, it's all very well having great ideas for buildings. So people started going out looking. And I thought, oh, well, it's not going to get anywhere. But within a couple of weeks, people found this building. They all started getting excited. And I started to panic because I thought, well, it's ridiculous. How can we, how can we get a building when we have no money? So a group of us went into this building and had a look around and we said, yeah, 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 it would be perfect. And I just said, you know, at one point, I thought, well, the honest truth is we actually don't have any money. It would be great. I think it was to hire it, at least it was about 60000 a year. Um, to buy it was 650000 This is 25 years ago. So um, I said, well, it's all very well. We don't have any money. There was a businessman that was just standing next to me who was a good friend of mine. And he said, I think this is perfect. I think the Lord's given me a nudge and I'll buy it for you. And I said, what? And I thought, oh, no, this is this has really got out of hand. This has got ridiculous. So I said, oh, no, you can't do that. He said, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll rent it back to you at very cheap rent. As long as my mortgage is, is covered, I'll rent it back to you. He said, I'll give it to you for 30000 a year, which was half of what was being charged at the time. And I begged him not to. I said, no, 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 you really can't do it. And he said, no, I'm going to. And I said, we haven't got a resource consent or anything. He said, I'll take the risk. So um, I started to panic a bit. And he said, look, it's all on me. It's all on me. So um, in the end, he bought this building for us and rented it out at $30,000 a year. Um, and that was the beginning of our church. That was wow. a year in, after a year as a church. Wow, that's so cool. Again, just an amazing provision. But but obviously, then there, there needed to be a journey around building that culture where you felt comfortable to talk about giving and um, and that your church actually um, really invested in the things of the kingdom and uh, into church. And 
So um, I know because I was at Grace for so long that there was a particular point. Was the first kind of time you really lent into that, uh, there was an offering for the poor, is that right? Or when, how did all that begin, Dave, with um, just really beginning to, to build that culture of generosity in your church? Well, what happens is when you get a building, you tend to get a lot more people coming along. So we got heaps of people come in and we went from two services to three services. And uh, we uh, desperately needed, we actually legally needed to do up our our kitchen and uh, the toilets because they they weren't compliant. So we needed to raise $300,000. And so I just did a a pledge. Now we had hundreds of people coming to our church. And as I say, over 90% of people never gave, but then I never talked about it. And uh, so I started saying, hey, we need money for for these toilets and stuff and for the kitchen. And nobody gave. And um, so I just kept talking about it and I got really frustrated. And then I looked at the, the books and I realized that there was a massively high percentage of people that never gave a cent. And I, it, it shocked me because I thought, you know, m- most of the people, a lot of the people were coming were mature Christians. They'd come from other churches and people loved all the things we did. We had great things for the kids and great things everywhere. But I realized to my horror that I'd created a consumer culture that people were very happy to come along and consume, but they actually didn't want to take part, you know, just like you wouldn't if you're, if you're, if you're a flatmate, you, you know, pay to keep things going. And I was just horrified. And I thought, oh my goodness, what have I done? And I thought, well, it actually is my fault. I've done it because I haven't talked about the fact that it takes everybody to, to, um, to, to give something to make the thing work. So um, I was terrified of talking about it for the first time. Like I literally got virtually no sleep the night before, I thought people will hate me, everybody will leave, there'll be a mass mass exodus. I got up and honestly, I was so nervous the first time I talked about it, I thought I was going to faint on the stage. Because, you know, it's a terrible thing, the fear of man, because on one hand, you don't want to be that pastor that's saying, give us your money type thing. So we had, you know, pendulum swung in the other direction where we almost apologized for taking up offerings. And it was ridiculous, really, because, you know, the sheer necessity of the thing is you somebody's got to pay for the toilet paper and somebody's got to pay for the power and all that sort of stuff so i started talking and i'd heard bill heibel say that with things like giving if people don't give you just keep talking until they do and so i sort of got onto this thing and i i felt as though well i prayed to the lord and i said lord would you just give us the money so i don't have to talk about it? and he said absolutely not because this is not about a building it's not about your toilet it's not about your kitchen this is about people's hearts and he convicted me and he said to me you have not been discipling people he said and it was really like a harsh thing you know you have not been a good shepherd because you've taught people about reading the bible and praying and all these other things but because of your fear you have not talked to them about giving and giving as you probably know takes up a third of jesus parables and sermons like jesus was talking about it always not because he wanted people's money but because he knows that where your treasure is there your heart is also and it's such a trap so god said to me look This has got nothing to do with kitchens and toilets. This is to do with people's hearts. And so he said, I want you to keep talking about it until people's hearts change. Well, somebody got a word actually that people, we would break something in the spiritual realm and people would become so generous like they were in the days of King David that when he was building the temple, he asked people to give money and they started to give money. And then they kept on giving and kept on giving. And even when they reached the amount that they um, needed, they didn't stop. They kept on going. And I thought, ah, ha, ha, you know, with these prophecies, you laugh and think, well, that's never going to happen. But anyway, something miraculous happened as we talked about it and as we prayed and fasted, something broke and people started becoming very generous. So we got to 300,000, 400,000. 500,000, I can't remember what we got to, but we said to people, you can stop giving now. Thank you very, very much. You can stop giving, but they didn't. People started giving more and more. And so we said, every cent we get above what we need is we will give away to the poor. And um, so I can't remember the final th- figure was it so many years ago, but I think $150,000, $200,000 was over that we put out to these incredible projects. So we got all our kitchen and everything done We were able to give money to the poor, but the best thing was people's hearts changed. And people said, a number of people came up to me and they said, you know, 
this has been a real thing in my heart that stopped my relationship with Jesus. There's been this part I could never surrender to God. And it was because that was my treasure. And it revealed all the stuff. And so I've realized, like, we do a topic on it every year. And it's not so much because we're trying, you know, we, we need the money so much. But I realize that this is a absolute key part in people's hearts and we don't say hey you must give this amount or that amount and we don't go through and check what people give it's just like we talk about prayer we never check out whether people pray or not but we say you need to pray you need to read your bible you know these are practices and also you need to give to the lord hmm. um so yeah um our church has progressively become more and more generous because I, I mean, one of the, the deep convictions I have in my heart is that everything Jesus calls us to is motivated by love and leads us to life. Everything is motivated by this heart of pure love and everything he calls us to leads us to life. And so this whole space of generosity, which is like we live in this Western consumer culture, we're formed by a Western consumer culture and we can really wrestle with, like, do it, you know, as you say, this exposes so much. Like, do I deeply trust in God as a, as a as a good heavenly father who'll provide for me and who cares for me. Um, and, and, but also, you know, the, the experience as you get freed from the hold that money can have on your heart is it's a feeling of joy and delight and freedom and, and deep satisfaction that, um, that you're using your money in a way that is in line with God's heart. So I just think this, as we've taken this uh, journey in the last couple of weeks with our own, um, you know, this whole offering for our building, um, just again, that deep, deep conviction. This is this is primarily a formation journey of our hearts as a church. Uh, already, I've just been very moved by the generosity of folks in our church. But there's this sense of like, hey, that's who we want to be. I mean, Jesus talked about in the Sermon on the Mount, giving, fasting, and prayer are the three big you know disciplines that he hits in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, and so, as things have moved forward for you, Dave, like, um, like. Obviously, that, that must have really helped you grow in faith uh, and um, and confidence. And it gave you, obviously, people didn't all just eat mass exodus your church because you started talking about giving and those sorts of things. Um, but the but also, I'm just so amazed at where things are at now. So I know, like, obviously, when we went through the earthquakes uh, in Christchurch, most churches wound up in some involuntary building project. <laughs> Um, but it really opened up some opportunities for um, for our church and uh, and at this stage your city campus and beach campus I think maybe planes and Pegasus had started um, but do you want to just tell us a little bit about the about what happened there uh, in terms of the opportunities that sort of really opened up but also I'm really interested in just the way that uh, your church particularly I know you've like whether it's someone that's that's struggling to make ends meet or someone that's done very well in life there's just a part to play within God's story that he's writing in Grace Vineyard and within our movement and with Bay Vineyard at the moment. I'd love to hear about that as well in terms of just your convictions around people's part to play in all of this. Well, the thing is, I personally had a big struggle before, long before I was a pastor with the whole thing to do with giving and finances. And, you know, I started moving the things of the Holy Spirit and praying for people and doing deliverance and a whole bunch of stuff like that. And at a certain point, God said to me, there's a, there's a part of you that you haven't given over to me. And that was this whole area to do with finance. And it's really funny. I was going to another church and... Uh, um, it's really funny that the moment God started pointing to me, I be started becoming critical about the church and the way they spent money. I never, ever felt critical. I never cared what they did with the money. But as soon as it was going to be my money, you know, I started well, look, and I thought, well, I can't give my money because, um, you know, well, I want to know what they do with it. And I want to know, you know, is, is it all accountable? And, you know, is the, you know, is it audited? And, you know, all these questions I never really cared about. But suddenly it became an issue. And God really spoke to me in my heart that this was a big issue. And so from the personal thing, I've realized that that this is a massive part of our growth. And so I say to everybody, no matter how poor or wealthy they are, this is actually part of growth. It doesn't matter whether it's building projects or not. So, for example, at the moment, I always say to people, I think it's important that you give something. And one of the things that I say is the smallest denomination that we have in New Zealand is a 10 cent coin. And I say, even if you commit to give a 10 cent coin once a year, then that's better than nothing because it breaks the spirit of something just to give something. And I've had people ring up and complain. There's one guy rang me up and he said, oh, you know, I can't believe, you know, my son's a student and, you know, he's got a student loan and, you know, I can't believe that you would ask somebody to give. And I said, 
I've asked them to give 10 cents a year. I said, you could find 10 cents on the road. And uh, I said to him, you know, he said, oh, yeah, but he's got a student. I said, yeah, I've got a mortgage, you know. So I said, he doesn't have to do it. But I just saying for his benefit, it's not going to do us any good having the 10 cents. But for his benefit, that something goes to the Lord. And I said to the, 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 the dad, I said, you know, does he go to the movies? And he's, he said, oh, yes, he does, you know, and rolled his eyes. So people can pay for what they treasure. So it's not a thing about twisting someone's arm. This is something that I think is for your good, that in your heart, if you can give something, then God is able to use you. Because I think I don't I'm not into the prosperity gospel in the sense that I give, you know, 10 cents and God gives me five dollars back. But I am into the prosperity gospel in the sense that if I plant a seed, it's actually going to grow into something. And if I don't plant a seed, it's not going to grow. And so I think that by giving something a tie, even something small, that it puts something into God's garden that he's he's able to use. It's like um, the feeding of the 5,000. You know, it was impossible to feed those 5,000. But Jesus said to the disciples, what do you have? Well, they literally didn't have anything, but they swiped a little kid's lunch and they brought him, you know, something tiny and they put it in the hands of Jesus. And that's where the miracle occurs. And I think God always says, what's the tiny thing that you've got? Just give me something small because he involves us in the miracle. And that's why I think the whole thing is so important. And that's why I encourage people. It would be lovely if everybody gave something, even if it's tiny, and then God can do the miracle. That's where the miracle comes. It's not in the large sums. It's in everybody giving their small piece. Mm. And so what? tell us about the uh, the earthquakes, obviously. I mean, that was a horrific time. I mean, I'm still a little bit triggered every now and then. We went through the cyclone, and I just, you know, all the memories came back and all the rest of it. But that was really tough. But through that, God just opened up some opportunities, and, and there was just... The, you know, again, he worked for good through a really tough time for Canterbury. Tell us about what happened out of, out of the earthquakes for the church. Um, and, and I'd love you also to touch on the importance of buildings, the fact that, you know, again, our vision isn't a building, it's what God does in and through a, a space. But but tell us about what happened in the earthquakes and then just, you know, about oh, your conviction around those things. The um, you know, happened. The worst one that hit us was in February, uh, February the 22nd, uh, 2011, and it uh, badly damaged our city campus. And so uh, we had the, the beach campus, which you were the pastor of at the time, which for a lot of the time we weren't able to use the, the, the main building, but we were able to use part of it uh we it opened up opportunities to um in the local um um hall the local community hall to uh have a free supermarket and um you know working together with the police and the army and that sort of thing i think it put us on the map uh for being involved in the community uh one of the sad thing was things was that we lost our building and uh, City Campus had to move over to Spraden Baptist for three years, which was really hard. This is an interesting thing. We lost 600 people in that time, people who just left because they couldn't, you know. Um, it was afternoon it, services. It was a young, like, it, was a, it was a church packed with young families that then had to meet at one o'clock and three o'clock. When you've got a young family, I mean, it's it sucked, but it was like, man, it was a tough, that was tough sledding, man. It was so I mean, tough. An interesting thing, we lost 600 people from, from City Campus. Our giving went up. <laughs> How do you figure that? Yeah, okay. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. Um, but, you know, out of that, um, God spoke to us about planting out. And so it was during that time that we adopted Plains Campus and moved into a different building, and then we planted out Pegasus. And so it was a different way of doing church. And it was incredible that our, we had already done so much talking about generosity and stuff that our church family was already uh, in the habit of giving generously and helping to um, you know, start new things in different places. So that actually kick-started us. Do you know what? This is an interesting figure. We, this is roughly what it was like. We went into the earthquakes with two campuses. We, had, we were running uh, five services and we had about $3 million worth of assets. Four years later, so after the earthquakes and all that sort of thing, we came out and we had four campuses. We were running five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten services. 
and we had roughly six or seven million dollars worth of assets. Now I don't I don't even know how you do the maths on that, but God blessed us in that time when we got absolutely hammered, when we had so much taken away from us, just through a whole series of insurance and a whole bunch of things, we came out better off, more people being touched, more flourishing than we had before. I mean, that's the economy of the kingdom. It just, I can't, can't even explain how that works, you know? Mm. It's the economy of the kingdom. And I think that's the thing. When you put what you have in God's hands and you trust him, he will always mm. multiply it. That, that's the thing of the kingdom. But I remember in, those, in that time, Dave, I mean, I was sitting in all those meetings and it's like there were moments where... Um, where there was real faith required and, and you led with real faith in terms of what you believed God was calling us into as a church at the time. Um, and, and it was really courageous, you know, in terms of like the, the temptation to just hunker down and all the rest of it. But to the fact that you, you and I remember vividly that uh, meeting we had one time where there was a building we could have got the city campus into. It was a bit small, but hey, at least it would get us in the mornings and, 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 and back to doing some morning services and stuff. And you, uh, everyone wanted it, the leadership team, the board wanted it and all the rest of it. And you just had this deep conviction and sense that it wasn't right. And, uh, and you had a great team. We all backed you in there, even though I was glad I wasn't leading the church through all of it. Um, and it was well, only I'll, about I'll a, tell you a that story. I'll tell you that yeah, story. But that was that's, incredible. A great, that's a great one to tell. So we were under a tremendous amount of pressure to get a, a building because as somebody said to me, we are hemorrhaging people, which we were, we were losing, you know, hundreds of people. And um, we were going backwards, it seemed, in most ways. And we were desperate to get out uh, of doing afternoon services. And this building came up and everybody just wanted to jump on it, including me, because it just seemed such a smart, it just seemed like anything other than what we were doing. And so we went along with it and, and all the pastors decided it was the right thing to do. We were going to have a board meeting that night where the final decision was going to be made. I went and had a bit of an afternoon snooze, I think, um, sort of in preparation for the meeting. And God spoke to me very clearly in that snooze, or I can't remember if it was awake or asleep, and he said, whatever you do, do not go into that building. <clears throat> it's wrong. Do not take it. So anyway, I thought, oh, well, hopefully somebody else amongst the board has got that message in their minds. So I went there and we discussed the issues. I didn't say because I thought, Lord, I want a witness. I want a confirmation. And as we went around, everybody said, um, you know, yes, let's do it. Yes, let's do it. Yes, let's do it. And I'm getting more panicked inside as they do because I thought everybody thinks yes, except me. And so as it went around, I felt as though the Lord say, you must say no, you must say no, you must say no. So it came to me and I just said, you know what? Um, I just feel as though the Lord's saying no, and I don't know why. And I thought, how's that going to go down? And one guy said, well, I've been with you for 20 years, and I believe you hear from the Lord. So he said, I'm with you. And they all said, we're with you. And I thought, oh, no, they trust me. And I thought, and I went away just absolutely freaked out because I thought, well, what if I'm wrong? What if we're still in Sprayden Baptist, you know, five years later, another church takes over this other thing we've been looking at and they thrive and we die. And all that sort of thing. So I went to bed that night and I just begged God. I said, please show me what you want me to do. And it was that night he said to me, I want you to go back into the building that you were in and I'll make the way. And it's a quite a miraculous story, but we'd sold our old building. Another guy had bought it, a Christian guy bought it, done it up, strengthened it. He let us get back. He said to me um, when I went and met with him, he said, how much did you pay when you originally got in? And I said to him, we were paying 30000 And he said, well, how would you like to pay that amount again? So this is 20 years later or oh, 12 or 15 years later. I said, I would love to pay that again. So he uh, let us get back in. And also he had, he had uh, bought a lot of the um, units beside. So he gave us all those ones as well. And so we've got back in there. We got our insurance money. We bought a $6 million building with the insurance money. And uh, it all worked out well because we listened to what God was telling us to do. Mm. A miracle. Yeah. As we, um, Dave, so in a couple of weeks, um, it's sort of like the time where we've said to our church, hey, we'd love you by this date to have really prayed, sought God, and uh, and come to some sort of conviction about what your part to play is. And like you said earlier, 
uh, my heart is like, I just want everyone to participate at the level of faith that they've got and just to be obedient, whatever that looks like. That's the, that's my dream. Everyone, so everyone's part of the story and everyone has in some way, shape or form been, you know, formed a little bit more uh, uh, in the way of the, the God who gave it all for us. Um, and so, you know, I remember those moments at Grace where certainly on that first uh, time where we did a, a proper focus on uh, raising uh, capital for building and uh, and the celebration at that service as we celebrated the the staggering generosity that came in on that first one but just what would you say to our church as as we look in the, in the next couple of weeks to uh, to make that decision to play our part uh, in what God, the story that God's writing here in the bay yeah i would just say that you don't want to you don't want to miss out don't wait and see what other people do. You be part of it. You pray and ask God what the, what you can give. And it's so exciting. I mean, the very first time we did it, we did when we bought that, but when we signed up to that building, we didn't have the money we needed to actually get it. So we, we stepped out in real faith to get it. We got $2.1 million, which was phenomenal. We've never, ever got that much again in a thing. But people just, they just went ballistic. We, we had... Numbers of people that just wrote out checks for $100,000 as soon as we gave the vision, just wrote out a check for $100,000 and, and, and gave it. And it was interesting. One guy came to me and he said, you know what? The Lord has been speaking to me and telling me to put money aside for something. And he said, I'll tell you, I'll let you know exactly when that is. And when I gave the vision, he said, the Lord said, that's the thing you give the money. So I would just encourage you, go to the Lord and ask him how you could be part part of it because you will be part of history you know in years to come in 23 i mean we're celebrating our 25th anniversary next year and you know people will be able to say i put you know money into that original building that was there um you know that'll go down in history who would not want to be part of that and it doesn't matter the amount it matters that you pray to god and ask him to give you what you can give in faith and generosity and give that and you you're part of making history and the thing i love which is so exciting is that we can do so much more when we work together that when it's just one person you do not want one very wealthy person buying you a building you want everybody to do something because then you all take part in this fantastic miracle so i'm so excited for you guys one little thing i will say and that is that i think uh, in this country and other countries, the enemy wants to stifle our churches through finances. And what he does is, you know, we can have great dreams and great visions and God can have his anointing and good stuff's happening. But the devil will try and cut the whole thing off through finances and buildings make a massive difference. You know, I was just recently uh, overseas and some there was a discussion going on, you know, if we raise money, why don't we just give it all to the poor? And I said to them, so what are you going to do? Just walk down the street and just hand out money. I said, when you get a building, you are giving to the poor. You are giving to the poor this year, next year, 10 years, 20 years. And it just goes on forever. You are investing in the future of your city. And so it is just the best thing that you can do to broaden the horizon of all the mission that you do. So I get very excited when it comes to buildings, very excited, because I know that they just do so much for the community. Yeah. And the reality is that, you know, that I was looking, I was thinking back of my life that this opportunity to give into something that, that has a multi-generational blessing that doesn't come along that often so yeah. i've been part of you know um, three building things we had one before we came to grace then we're at grace and and that was a big part of our story and i'm again i'm like i'm part of that story i love it i was in the Chewham Street, the, the big new city campus building. I was in there for the first time and I led worship. I played the first song in that building. We sang Wairua Tapu and we welcomed the Holy Spirit into that. My, I'm connected to that. I'm connected to the church in Wellington. Um, and I'm like, this is such an, a privilege that we get this opportunity uh, to uh, invest in things that count for eternity. And um, and I particularly have this sense of, um, you know, I think I think there are folks in our church who have had that conversation with God many years ago, and they said, well, "If you entrust me with finance, I'm going to I'm going to be I'm going to give uh, my life for the kingdom of God. I'm going to be generous to the kingdom." 
and this is an opportunity to fulfill that promise you know it's just say one other thing too is i just think it is a massive legacy for our children and our grandchildren as well and you know what i always grew up in presbyterian or a methodist church or whatever and we were in buildings that other people had invested into and you know we've had people from other churches saying oh you know i'm an anglican or i'm presbyterian we don't have building funds and i say yeah that's because your granddad or your great granddad or whatever they were the ones that paid the price but i've got grandkids now and i am so excited about the fact that i'm investing into their future and that i'm going to pay the price for something that they're going to get to do in years to come i have my little grandkids at church every week dancing and loving church with all their hearts and you know there's nothing that pleases me more and so giving into that knowing that they're going to grow up probably in uh, this thing that we've sacrificed for nothing gives me more pleasure than that i just think it's a it's an investment into our own family legacy uh, you know just giving to our kids and grandkids but also for the city for their friends and and you know it's oh you know i i get very very excited about buildings i really do Dave, can you pray for us, mate? You know, this is Absolutely. a, you know, our church is five years old. This is a, this is a step of faith for us, um, you know, and um, there's a sense of excitement, but also um, there's that sense of a little bit of vulnerability around, hey, God's inviting us into something that is very countercultural, mm-hmm. and uh, and and the stakes are high in terms of the kingdom of God in this moment for us. And our church already has respond, responded beautifully. But I'd love you to pray just with the faith that it. you have. And can uh, I say how courageous church. it is in a time too when churches are closing down and selling, and you know churches are emptying out to go against that trend and to be building churches is so exciting so let me pray i'd love to father i thank you for the courage of sam and jen and all the team at bay vineyard thank you lord that they are going against the flow of society because it is so important that the kingdom advances across our nation aotearoa but in napier as well and lord we thank you that that these guys are investing into the future of that wonderful city and lord i i pray that you'd speak into the hearts that you would tap people on the shoulders to be generous and that that they could could give cheerfully i know sam and jen wouldn't want anybody to give a cent that isn't given willingly and freely and cheerfully but lord i pray that there would be just such excitement and such joy about giving to the lord's house And Lord, I pray that uh, they would be able to do more magnificently than they could ever have believed, that as they put a little bit into your hands, you miraculously multiply it. And Lord, I pray that, that we will be able to stand back and cheer at what they're able to do because you're working with them and you're a God of miracles. Mm. So Lord, give them courage, give them confidence, and we pray that we can all as a movement celebrate uh, as they get into this building and you change their city. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Dave.